60 Minutes Rewind. It's been two and a half months since Bernard L. Madoff was picked up and charged with what's believed to be the largest financial fraud in history. Yet we still don't know much more about the alleged $50 billion scam than what Madoff initially told the FBI agents who arrested him. There are still no indictments as federal prosecutors continue to unravel the case and to try and figure out exactly what happened and who all was involved. But the proof that it happened can be found in the ruined lives of thousands of victims. The one person who knows the most and is willing to talk is Harry Markopoulos, the man who figured out Madoff's scheme before anyone else. He sat down with us for his only television interview. Until a few months ago, Harry Markopoulos was an obscure financial analyst and mildly eccentric fraud investigator from Boston, who most people would never notice on the street. My modern Greek hero, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but today he enjoys an almost heroic status, pursued by journalists and movie producers and honored by colleagues as the man who went to the Securities and Exchange Commission and blew the whistle on Bernie Madoff and his $50 billion fraud. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Please take your seats. But he thank seems you. uncomfortable with all the attention and knows that he is no hero. Uh, I stand before you a $50 billion failure. Uh, <laughs> How many times did you send material to the SEC? May 2000, October 2001, October, November, and December 2005, then again June 2007, and finally April 2008. Mm -hmm. So five separate SEC submissions. And in spite of all of the things that you did, it still ended up in disaster. There's nothing to be proud about in this case. I feel horrible about the result. It's been a total disaster for the victims. It began a decade ago when Marco Polis was working for a Boston investment firm. His boss told him that Bernard Madoff, a former chairman of the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, was running a huge unregistered hedge fund that was producing incredible returns. He wanted Harry to reverse engineer its trading strategy and revenue streams so that the firm could duplicate Madoff's results. He had the patina of being a respected citizen, one of the most successful businessmen in New York, and certainly one of the most powerful men on Wall Street. You would never suspect him of fraud unless you knew the math. So, I mean, you're like a math guy, right? I've taken all the calculus courses from integral calculus to differential calculus, as well as linear algebra, and statistics, both normal and non-normal. How long did it take you to figure out that there was something wrong? It took me five minutes to know that it was a fraud. It took me another almost four hours of mathematical modeling to prove that it was a fraud. What were the things that caught your attention? It was the performance line. As we know, that markets go up and down, and his only went up. He had very few down months. Only 4% of the months were down months, and that would be equivalent to a baseball player in, in the major leagues batting 960 for a year. Clearly impossible. You would suspect cheating immediately. Maybe he was just good. No one's that good. Harry said there were only two plausible explanations. Either Madoff was using insider information to rack up huge profits, or he was running a giant Ponzi scheme. So either way, he was doing something illegal. Either way, I knew he was going to go to prison. In May of 2000, Marco Polis took his suspicions about Bernie Madoff to the Boston office of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Did you have any financial motive? Yes. He was a competitor of mine in 2000 to 2004 while I was still in the industry. And when someone's competing on your playing field, who's a dirty player, you want him tossed off the field. He also thought he might be eligible for a sizable reward if the fraud involved insider trading, but that turned out not to be the case. In your first letter to the SEC back in 2000, you're a little tentative. You say, look, I have no smoking gun. In 2000, it was more theoretical. In 2001, it was a little bit more real. By 2005, I had 29 red flags that you just couldn't miss on. By, by 2005, the degree of certainty was approaching 100%. Over time, and with some simple math calculations, Marco Polis concluded that for Madoff to execute the trading strategy he said he was using, he would have had to buy more options on the Chicago Options Exchange than actually existed. Yet he says no one he spoke to there remembered making a single trade with Bernie Madoff's fund. 
I would talk to the people I had trading relationships with and ask, did you have a trading relationship with Mr. Bernard Madoff? And they all said, no, we don't think he's for real. Could you find anybody? I found no one that ever traded with Mr. Madoff, and I traded with the largest equity derivatives firms in the world. And that's because Madoff's investment fund never actually made any trades, at least going back to 1993 and probably further. A fact confirmed last week at a meeting of Madoff investors by the trustee charged with liquidating his assets. No one knew the depth of the fraud, but a lot of people had questions. Who else figured this out besides you? I would say that hundreds of people suspected something was amiss with the Madoff operation. If you look at who the victims were not, you'll notice that the major firms on Wall Street had no money with Mr. Madoff. I mean, you write in the, this is the letter, I'm quoting from the letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission, red flag number 20. Madoff is suspected of being a fraud by some of the world's largest, most sophisticated financial services firms. And then you list some of the firms. Yes, I do. The biggest firms on Wall Street in conversations with people high up in those firms. That is correct. And the SEC ignored that. Did they call any of these people? All the SEC had to do was pick up the phone. They never did. If you had executives at, at the biggest investment houses in Wall Street that knew something was wrong, why do you think they didn't go to the SEC? Because people in glass houses don't throw stones, and self-regulation on Wall Street doesn't work. In January 2006, the New York Office of the Securities and Exchange Commission finally opened a case file to look into Harry's allegations about Bernie Madoff. Despite uncovering evidence that Madoff had misled them about his investment activities, the SEC closed the case 11 months later without ever opening a formal investigation. The staff said there was no evidence of fraud. What I found out from my dealings with the SEC over eight and a half years is that their people are totally untrained in finance, they're unschooled, most of them are just merely lawyers without any financial industry experience. Well, if the people there aren't trained in securities work, what are they trained in? how to look at pieces of paper that the securities laws require. They can check every piece of paper perfectly and find misdemeanors, and they'll miss all the financial felonies that are occurring because they never look there. Even when pointed to fraud, they're incapable of finding fraud. No one at the SEC would talk to us on the record about Harry Markopoulos' allegations, but one person who seemed to have had a high opinion of the agency was Bernie Madoff. I'm very close with the regulators, so I'm not trying to say that they can't, you know, that what they do is bad. As a matter of fact, my niece just married one. Besides his niece's husband, who no longer works at the SEC, Madoff has had long-standing ties to the agency and has been called upon to give advice. At this 2007 meeting of a nonprofit group called the Philoctetes Center, Madoff seemed to think the SEC was doing a great job. You know, in today's regulatory environment, it's virtually impossible to, to violate rules. I mean, this is something that the public really doesn't understand. But you, it's impossible for you to go under, for a violation to go undetected. Certainly not for a, a considerable period of time. But don't try and tell that to the Phil Octades Center today. Its main benefactor, the Betty and Norman Levy Foundation, was fully invested in Madoff, one of dozens of charitable organizations that have been devastated or wiped out. Madoff's customer list, single-spaced with small type, is 162 pages long, with victims running the gamut from Hollywood royalty to a carpenter's pension fund in Syracuse, New York. Shelley Ludlow has been forced to put her mother in a Medicaid-assisted living facility while she packed up their apartment to move in with a friend, all because of Bernie Madoff. Her whole lives were turned upside down by this man that sits in his penthouse and smirks. <sighs> the same day last week, 70 miles away, Len and Marge Forrest were leaving their house that they had just sold in Setauket, Long Island, and were preparing to drive to South Florida to sell their home there. They had their money with Bernie Madoff for 30 years and lost an eight-figure family fortune two days before his 80th birthday. Do you have any money to live on? Enough, I would say, for 60 days. Do you know other people who are in the same situation? Oh, yes. We have a lot. Unfortunately, and I think probably the thing that tears me up more than anything is the fact that I recommended Madoff to a number of people. And uh, 
and they lost their money, and I, I, I'll never stop feeling responsible for that. They were all close family and friends. Len Forrest and his friends thought they were part of a small, exclusive group of investors lucky enough to have a connection with Bernie Madoff. And because they thought they were making 12% a year, they weren't inclined to ask a lot of questions. Harry Markopoulos called it the classic affinity scam. An affinity scam is where you prey on groups that are similar in nature to yourself. So I'm Greek. If I was going to run an affinity scam, I would run it on the Greek-American community here. Bernie was Jewish, so he ran it on the Jewish community in the United States, but that, didn't, that wouldn't get him enough customers because he always needed new money to keep the scheme going. The story will continue after this. Over time, Madoff extended his reach from New York to Palm Beach, where he enlisted hundreds of wealthy clients, many of them recruited from his own country clubs. And he also made connections that gave him entree to Europe, and the hedge fund capital of America, Greenwich, Connecticut. It was here that Bernie Madoff made some of his biggest deals with large investment firms that were willing to feed him billions of dollars of their clients' money to manage. And in return, Bernie Madoff agreed to pay these so-called feeder funds a fortune in annual fees. The largest of the feeder funds was the Fairfield Greenwich Group. How much money did Fairfield make off Bernie Madoff every year? Hundreds of millions of dollars. If you're a feeder fund, what are you supposed to do for those hundreds of millions of dollars? You're supposed to identify the world's best hedge fund managers and invest only in them, and you're supposed to make sure they're not running Ponzi schemes. And the real steroids here were the feeder funds. That's what made it an international Ponzi scheme. Attorney David Boys is one of the most prominent lawyers in the country and is representing Fairfield Greenwich investors who lost nearly $7 billion when Madoff went under. They're suing the firm for gross negligence, claiming it failed to investigate Madoff thoroughly or monitor his activities as it promised to do in its marketing materials. Analysis of portfolio composition, portfolio stress testing, risk management, asset verification. Do you think that really happened? No, we know it didn't happen because we know all they did was turn the money over to Bernie Madoff, and they did that for 20 years. They did nothing? They essentially did nothing except lose their investors' money and enjoy very luxurious lifestyles from the money they took out. Walter Knoll, one of the founding partners of Fairfield Greenwich, declined to talk to us and has reportedly been lying low with his wife at their compound on the private island of Mystique. But in a statement to 60 Minutes, his firm said that it too was a victim of Bernie Madoff, that it had placed too much trust in his then impeccable reputation and in the fact that there had been multiple reviews of Madoff by the SEC. In the end, Harry Markopoulos had been right about Bernie Madoff. He will be going to prison, but not because of anything that Harry or the SEC did. In a bad economy, Madoff's lies simply collapsed under their own weight. No one was investigating Mr. Madoff at the end. So he turned himself in before anybody in a position of authority began a serious investigation. That's typically how the SEC does it. They come in after the crime has been committed. They toe-tag the victims, count the bodies, and try to figure out who the crooks were after the fact, which does none of us any good. <laughs> 